So most of you may or may not know this, but when Nike was created, Bill Bowerman, the track coach from Oregon, actually the, the original idea, he went to um, New Zealand, of all places, and he does a sabbatical with a guy called Art Lydiard, who was the head of the South Island Institute of Sport. Art Lydiard has passed away since. And he was with Art Lydiard, and he noticed the people in Christchurch engaged in a very strange behavior. They would run around the park, this is the early 60s, every morning before and after work. And Bauman, who's a track coach, says to Lydiard, who's also a track coach, what are they doing? Is there an event on? Are they part of the university? And he's like, no, they're running for fun and recreation. The later co-founder of Nike says, nobody runs for fun and recreation. He's, What's it called? Jogging. Never heard of it in his life. Does it for six weeks. Long, slow, middle distance speeds. Loses an inch off his belt line. Comes back to America. Thinks he's discovered the panacea. Partners up with a cardiologist. They write a book called Jogging. <laughs> it sold a million copies. This is a story, true story. This is the story. And all of a sudden, the running phenomenon gets legs, pardon the pun. And they, um, but no one had access to equipment. So Blue Ribbon Sports gets set up, and they start importing mostly product from Japan to serve the amateur athlete, because the number one challenge the amateur athlete once had was getting access to product. Do any of you, and you're all in Nike's parlance, you're all amateur athletes. Some of you more than others, but we're all amateur athletes, right? Any of you struggling to get access to product? Any of your borrowers struggling to get access to mortgages? Unless you're going after a super unique, maybe it's subprime, maybe it's me, like when I moved to America, I couldn't get a $1,000 credit card. I buy the bank building, but I can't get a credit card. Like, <laughs> seriously, this is a true story. No one wanted to touch me. No one would go near me. I'm like, you should be solving my problem. That would have been good for you. So there's not many people who need that problem solved. So stop thinking your point of difference is access to mortgages. It's not. So what did Nike do next? Well, people don't just want access to product. They want to look powerful or pretty or fit while they do it. I live in Denver these days. I look out my office door every day. There's like a 1,000 people streaming past with their yoga mats. They haven't done yoga in 10 years. Half of them are high, but they carry the thing anyway, right? Like, look at me. I'm into the health and wellness lifestyle, right? You go on a date in Denver, and all they want to wear is Lululemon. You're like, put a... Anyway, whatever, right? No one has trouble accessing athleisure wear, is that fair? You have trouble not wearing anything else, right? But that's like... So I want to be like Mike, Bo Jackson. Even the campaign that Nike have just launched, that's still table stakes, making that brand remain cool and fringe and edgy, right? That's just table stakes. The highest order problem that the amateur athlete faces is what? What is the number one thing between us and being with Jonathan tomorrow morning at 6 a.m. Whoever said motivation, coaching is an accountability methodology to overcome the motivational issues, it's priorities, that's the right answer. It's that some days we'd rather sleep than work out, most days we'd rather work than work out, or you make a promise like San Diego, it's gonna be so beautiful, I'm gonna run every day, and then you have like seven margaritas tonight, and your alarm goes off, you're like, that's not gonna happen, right? <laughs> But what have you told 5,000 of your closest friends on social media? Now you're feeling a little bit of accountability. So all you do is just step outside on the concourse. <laughs> totally ran 5Ks today, except that Nike put a sensor in your shoes and Apple put an accelerometer on your phone and they're like, ba boom. You walk like 150 steps unless you're in the South Tower. It was like 1,500 steps. <laughs> and that's pretty, <laughs> that's pretty much all you've done, sweetie. Like, anyway. Because Nike have worked out, in the same way Domino's worked out what business they were in, Nike worked out they're in the behavior change business. So they launch a thing like Nike Plus, which is basically a, ma it's like a rocket mortgage version of what Jonathan could do for you. And plenty of people use it, 28 million of them every day, actually. They set 100 million goals. We're going to do a marathon. We're on a 5K. 2.5 billion miles have been tracked on this platform. If you run 2.5 billion miles, what do you need a lot of? Shoes. Nike makes no money on Nike Plus. It makes all its money selling you shoes. But they want to own that place in your mind. Does that make sense? What is the most complicated 
messy and difficult part of this whole thing. They've moved into the hardest problem to solve, by far. But check this out. If you intend to solve the same problems in the same ways as everybody else, then don't complain that you get commoditized. Nike have no interest in that. Last year, this day, they were an $80 billion company. Today, they're a $135 billion company. Why? Because those 28 million people spend three times more money in Nike stores, of which they now only have 40 retail partners they'll work with. They're firing the people who don't understand, going direct to the consumer where they need to. And they grew 65% from an $80 billion base. And they got, anyway, what is possible is mind-blowing when you think about the converging forces of disruption creating emerging new. They couldn't have done this, could they? They couldn't have done this, what, five years ago, 10 years ago? But they can do it now. Here is what our research tells us are the opportunities up and to the right. Okay, we're not going to spend a lot of time here because you need to come up with your own version of this. We studied for five years companies that outperform their competitors sustainably at higher margins, and we try to find out what, they were, what problem they were solving. Here's what our research told us. Number one, they were solving the higher order problem, Nike example. Two, they were absorbing and embracing the complexity that was found there because no one wants to deal with complexity. This is a big part of what you do. By the way, I think your higher order problem is the emotional state of the journey of going through the mortgage process. I think the complexity is all of the stuff that you manage to hide from your client. We might want to make him feel just a little bit of it, but not too much. The ability to make it easy, so eliminating that friction. Fourth thing we found was mitigating risk. How do you make me feel safer in this process? Another core part of what you should be thinking about. And then interestingly, and we fought this finding, like we were like, oh, it's a bit soft. Purpose. Companies like Warby Parker, orienting their whole, did you see this week Danone? One of the largest food companies in the world is declaring itself a B corporation. Unilever, the CEO of the second largest packaged goods company in the world, came out on his first day in the job and said to the shareholders, don't work for you. I work for the customers and the community. He later said that he didn't think anyone would ever get fired on their first day, but I reckon he went pretty close. <laughs> Unilever has outperformed Procter & Gamble two to one since Paul Pullman took over. Purpose. What do you stand for? What is the values alignment? Do you believe what I believe? Have I got reason to trust you? Part of why I would trust you is expertise, your ability to solve my... This is what our research found, okay? The point, though, is not whether you take those five things. The point is to remember that you must find your thing. And answers like, it's the people, or we give good service, not getting it done. You didn't hear anything soft and esoteric in those examples, right? They were hard examples. They were moving into things that are difficult to solve. Things that could never be automated. And once you figure out how to do them, then they'll be able to get automated. And then you'll have to take one foot out of order and one foot into chaos, one foot out of comfort, one foot into discomfort, one foot out of pleasure, and one foot into pain, and you walk the line, constantly moving up and to the right up and to the right. You have to be multiple standard deviations from average to differentiate yourself in the marketplace. Otherwise, don't complain. So, that would be the question you might want to think about. What is this for you? Again, I'll give you the slides. You can go through this sort of stuff. I didn't give you examples of all five of those things. We'll find a way to give you some, uh, some content around that as well. Um, so, what do you do next is the question, right? Well, 